Welcome back to our next video. So we will be picking up where we left off in part one. So we are going to complete objectives four and five in this video. So that is simply to just tell you the types of bonds that, that are present in nucleic acids and the role that they play. All right, and we are also going to explain the importance of hydrogen bonding and base pairing in the process of DNA replication. So in the nucleic acid structure, there are two types of bonds. You have hydrogen bonding, as is shown in the objective here. So we have hydrogen bonding and we also have covalent bonds. So there are two types of bonds in here, nucleic acid, hydrogen bonds and covalent bonds. Hydrogen bonds, those are intermolecular forces, right? Whereas the covalent bond now is a stronger bond as it is an inter, not inter, intra molecular force. And welcome back in this video, we're just continuing from where we left off in part one. So for this one, we're going to look at the types of bonds that we have in nucleic acid and their function. And we will also explain the importance of hydrogen bonding and base pairing to the process of DNA replication. For DNA, it has two types of bonds present. It has hydrogen bonds and covalent bonds. The hydrogen bonds are formed between the bases and complementary strands of DNA, as you will see shortly. So you have, as you know, DNA is double-stranded and they are held together by hydrogen bonds between bases and the two strands of DNA. The covalent bond now is formed between the hydroxyl group on one nucleotide and the phosphate group and the next one. So that is what we are going to look at now. All right, so in looking at the structure of DNA, so you need to know that hydrogen bonds, as I have written down here, are the hydrogen bonds are what holds the two strands together. So let us say this is one strand of DNA. And this is a next, the second strand of DNA. So to hold the two strands together, we need the bases. Adenine always bonds with thymine and cytosine bonds with guanine. So let us say the red, uh, that means a different color. So that is one base. Let us say purple is adenine. And let us say green is thymine. So the bases are complementary. So we say we have complementary base pairing occurring in DNA. Base pairing simply means that they, it simply means that two bases are pairing with each other and it's complementary meaning so adenine it will not bond with guanine or cytosine it bonds with thymine so let me put thymine here so we have adenine on one strand of dna and we have thymine on the next strand so the two of them now need to base pair. Now that to base pair, we need hydrogen bonds to form between them. So I'm going to draw broken lines to represent the hydrogen bonds. And 
and I'm drawing two broken lines because if you read, so you can pause the video and read what is here. So adenine and thymine, two hydrogen bonds are formed between them. So remember, hydrogen bonds are intermolecular forces of attraction. So they're not actual bonds that involve the sharing of electron, like a covalent bond. So it is simply an attraction, right? So let us do cytosine and guanine. Let us say that color is cytosine. So if cytosine is here, it means directly across from it, it has to be guanine. That is what complementary base pairing deals with. So the blue is guanine. And let's put the hydrogen bond in there now. No cytosine and guanine, they formed three hydrogen bonds. Right? Now, if you look, if you read, it will show you that CG bonds are here. CG bonds are stronger than AT bonds. So because between adenine and thymine, you only have two hydrogen bonds, but between cytosine and guanine, there are three. So it would require more energy to break three hydrogen bonds than two. So CG bonds are stronger than AT bonds. So this is what, so when we refer to base pairing in DNA, this is what we are referring to. One, one base on one strand of DNA pairs with its complementary base on the other strand of DNA. So if you have adenine here across from it must be thymine. If cytosine is here, then it must have guanine. So to test if you understand, I am going to put, what was it? Let me put guanine here. And you should be able to tell me what should be across from it. So if this is guanine, what should be on this side? Remember it's complementary base pairing. What does G always pairs with? If you can answer that, you are understanding what is happening. So G always pairs with C. So it doesn't mean that C must be on this strand and G over here. If G is here, then it means that C must be on this side. And again, so I'm just showing you the three hydrogen ones. And I'm going to do one final one. So if thymine is here, it means that on this side, you must have adenine. And as said, between adenine and thymine, it's two hydrogen bonds. Now also the percentage of adenine and thymine 
are the same in an organism. So like, let's say if you have five percent adenine, you must also have five percent thymine. Because remember, they are complementary. So you cannot have more of the other base. So you cannot have 10% adenine and 5% thymine because there would not be enough of the other. So if it was 15% adenine, you couldn't have 5% thymine because remember, there must be enough thymine to bond with, uh, to bond with adenine. Likewise, for cytosine and guanine. And this, this is referred to as Chargaff's rule. Right. So the amount of bases, the amount of complementary bases are equal. All right. All right, so as I can see here, I have just introduced you to the hydrogen bonding and you now know its function. So without hydrogen bonds, we could not have base pairs forming. The next thing now, this DNA strand here, right? It's a very simplified version and you will only need a simplified version. So we only use the two lines to represent the two strands of DNA. And sticking off of each strand are the bases. And between them are the hydrogen bonds. Now you have to label your strands five prime, and I will show you why it is five prime and three prime. So one at the top, you have five prime. And so it's five prime, and this end is three prime. No, the DNA strands, we say they run anti-parallel to each other. That simply means that if this strands, if this strand here, if it runs five prime to three prime, then the other, th the, the other strand, it must be doing the opposite. It must run three prime to five prime. So we say that the strands, the two strands, the two DNA strands run anti-parallel to each other. So this is a basic structure of your DNA. You must not leave off the, the so five prime, three prime, three prime, five prime. The hydrogen bonds are between the bases. Now remember, we have two types of bonds in DNA. This is the hydrogen bond, and we also have the covalent bond. So now I'm going to show you how the covalent bonds are formed. So the covalent bonds are formed between the nucleotides. So this structure right here, it would be one nucleotide. This would be a next one. This would be a next one. So between here, you would have the covalent. That's don't use block. You would have the phosphate backbone. So the, the yellow here, it represents phosphate. But I'm going to draw a, a different structure so you can see it. But just to differentiate between the two bonds, the hydrogen bonds, those are between your bases, right? They are what is responsible for the base pair forming. The phosphate now, 
So the phosphate bond or the phosphodiester bond, it is responsible for joining the nucleotides. So this trend of DNA, it would not be possible if it wasn't for the, what we also call it a phosphodiester bond, all right? But it is also a covalent bond, all right? So we have the covalent bond within this strand of DNA. Hydrogen bond is between base pairs on each strand of DNA. But the covalent one now, we say it is the backbone of DNA because it is responsible for the formation of the DNA strand. All right, so that is it. So I'm going to do a different structure now showing the phosphate bond and the new between the nucleotides. All right. Yes. I right, say so if you if you remember the basic structure of the DNA, it's your deoxyribose sugar, which is a pentose sugar. Remember, you don't need to know the actual structure. We're just using shapes. So it's a pentagon because it's a five carbon sugar, right? Shape like that. Then you would have your nucleotide, sorry. You would have your base on this side. Now this is carbon one, carbon one, two, three, four. And then carbon five is here. So the phosphate group, if you remember, the phosphate group, it is attached to carbon number five. I'm just going to put a P inside to represent phosphate. All right. And I'm just going to write base. All right, I'm going to put the, the, the letter of a base. So let's put A for adenine. All right. So that's your new nucleotide. The oxyribo sugar, natural genus base, and the phosphate group. Now, I will need to erase this tree here. Now, these carbon atoms, they have OH group attached to them. The difference, so let me just remind you, I'm not sure if I mentioned it in the first video. The difference between deoxyribose and ribose, in ribose, carbon, carbon number two, it has an OH group attached. So in, in ribose, you have an OH group on carbon number two, All right? But in deoxyribose, we don't have any hydrogen, we don't have any OH group, it's a hydrogen. So that's the difference between the sugars. So ribose, two OH groups, deoxyribose and carbon two, you have a hydrogen, right? Now remember we said that the covalent bond is what holds the DNA together in a single, in a single strand. So here you just have a single nucleotide. Remember DNA is a polynucleotide, which means that we must join multiple nucleotides together. So that is one nucleotide. And if you remember, we said that what? It is formed between the five prime phosphate 
So the phosphate group is, is attached to carbon number five. And if you remember the DNA I drew, it started with five prime. That is where the five prime is coming from because the phosphate group is always sticking out freely. So this phosphate group, it is free. It is a five prime end. That is why when we draw a simple stick diagram for DNA, we just draw a line and put five prime. This is representing the free phosphate group here attached to carbon number five. So I'm going to draw a second, second one now, a second sugar molecule or a second nucleotide. Get a little bit and again, you have the base. And then you have the phosphate group. All right. Now remember the phosphate group has four oxygen. The reaction is going to take place between the OH group and the phosphate group to form what we call a phosphor diester bond. Now, to know the reaction and do it is not required. As I said, as you can see here, we are just using shapes. So to show that, all right, what I'm going to do now is erase the OH group, all right, erase this phosphate. So remember, this is the three prime carbon, and this is the five prime carbon. So what this is representing is your phosphor diester bond or your covalent bond. And it is formed between carbon number three. So the OH group, so remember, an OH group was here. So it is formed between the OH group and carbon number three of one of your nucleotides. Right, but specifically the sugar of one of your nucleotides. And it is formed also between the phosphate group and carbon number five. All right. So this is one nucleotide, this is a next nucleotide, and they are joined together by a phosphodiester bond, right? Which is a covalent bond. So that is why we say in DNA, you have your hydrogen bonds. Let me just put two adenine forms two hydrogen bonds. Let me put this as, let's say, cytosine. All right, so this is one strand of DNA. Let me draw next nucleotide. All right, I'm going to pause it and draw it and then play it. All right, so here of it. So remember on this strand, let me switch it ink. When I drew it, I drew a line and I wrote five prime to three prime. If you notice here, the DNA, it has a free 
phosphate group, right? And the five prime carbon. And it will end with the OH group down here, right? And the three prime carbon. So this carbon here, that's carbon number three. So if you notice the DNA, it starts, or it has a free five prime end at the top and below it's the free OH group that is, so it is free to form a bond with a phosphate group and the five prime carbon below it. So next in line, you would have a next sugar, right? With the phosphate group sticking off, right? Five prime end. Good. So when you see the simplified line joins, five prime to three prime, that is why. So these numbers, this is where it is coming from. The actual structure of the nucleotide. As you can see, there's a free phosphate group on the five prime carbon. So it starts with five. And as you can see, when it, whenever it stops, it is stopping with the three prime OH group, all right? That is free. So one strand of DNA, it runs five prime to three prime. Now remember we said the next strand now, it runs anti-parallel. So it starts with three prime and ends with five prime. So that means the nucleotide and the next strand, it cannot be in this orientation because if we look based on this orientation, when we draw the nucleotide, like this, the base is pointing to the right hand side, right? So it's sticking off like this. So that means we need to rearrange it so that the base is actually in line with the next one, right? On this strand of DNA. So we cannot have it running five. So that is why we cannot have DNA running alongside each other in a parallel manner. So you cannot have five tree, five tree. So if it was like this, right? So remember we say DNA, it needs to form base pairs. If it was five prime to three prime on both strand, you notice there could not be any base pair farming. Let us just do it here. So let me use a different color. All right. So let us say this was the nucleotide from one strand. All right. So I'm just showing you here why DNA runs anti parallel and not parallel. So remember now this configuration, when the phosphate group is here, that is five prime, and we would have the three prime OH group below. All right. Same thing here. So the question is, how will we get the base pair if both strands are going five prime to three prime. It would not form, right? One base is here, the next one is here. The two bases need to be facing each other. So we have to change our rotate the sugar, the, not the sugar, we have to rotate the entire nucleotide molecule so that this base here is facing this one. So that is why the DNA strands has to run anti-parallel. If they were parallel to each other, we would not have any base pair forming. We would not have any hydrogen bonds either. Because remember the hydrogen bonds are formed between the two bases and opposite strands. Good. 
So DNA runs anti parallel to each other. When that happens, we can have base pairing occurring. And we will see why it is important for DNA replication shortly. All right. So I'm going to pause here and draw the second strand. I don't want the, the video to be too long. All right, so here's the, here it is now. These two strands of DNA, one strand running five prime to three prime. Remember to get, in order to get the base pairs, right? These strands have to be anti-parallel. So as you can see for this strand, the three prime, so the OH group on carbon number three. So remember, this is carbon one, Two, and this is carbon number three. All right. So this trans starts out with the three prime end being the free end. These are the phosphate groups, as you know. All right. So the covalent bond that is formed between the phosphate group of carbon five and the OH group of carbon three. So all right, let me just do it. So remember. This would be a five, this would be three, carbon three, then this would be five, then this would be carbon three, all right? So this is the basic structure of DNA. So now you should be able to see why, because we are not going to be using this structure as we go further into explaining DNA replication and so forth. The, the lines are what we use, all right? We are just going to draw a line and write five, three. But I'm drawing this chapter so you can understand why we are five and three and why they should go in opposite direction. So let me just quickly go over it again. So one strand of DNA, it going five prime to three prime. We cannot get any base pair forming unless the two bases are pointing towards each other so that hydrogen bonds can be formed. So to get this, this the nucleotides in this trans we have to reorientate them so that the bases are pointing towards each other. And because of that, the three prime end is the one we start out with. So it goes three prime to five prime. The bases are in the middle with the base pair, right? So if you get this to label or say, point out the two types of bonds present, you should know that in the, in the middle, you should have your hydrogen bonds. Right? So this is the hydrogen bonds, AT as two, CG as three. This is your base pair. So the AT, that's your base pair. The red line, that's your hydrogen bond. Red line, hydrogen bonds, right? And this right here, that's your covalent bond. Covalent are the phosphodiester bond. All right. So that's it for the structure of DNA. Now, why is this, why is this structure or why is base pairing? So remember, we need to explain the importance of base pairing and hydrogen bond in DNA replication. So in order to do that, let me just erase some of these variants. All right, so I'm going to, as I know now, all we're doing is drawing, drawing the lines. So five prime, three prime. So we can draw them horizontally as well. So if one strand is going five prime to three prime, we know that they run anti-parallel. So the next strand must be going three prime to 
five prime. Because it always runs until parallel to each other, as you see over here. Okay. I'm just going to join them together using purple lines. I can use yellow for some. So I'm using these lines to represent the base pairs, although it should be two different colors on each strand. All right, so this is the DNA, right? When DNA is going to replicate, both strands will have to separate. So both strands will have to separate. And we will look at this in the next video, DNA replication. So when they separate, you would have the nucleotides sticking off, right? No, replication means that we are making new copies of DNA. And remember, DNA is double-stranded. So when it separates, we have two single strands. How are we going to get back the double-stranded DNA? that is through base pairing. So new bases will be added to form back a second strand. So without the base pairing, we would not be able to get back a second strand. All right. And remember base pairing occurs through hydrogen bonding. So without base pairing and hydrogen bonding, DNA replication would not occur. So again, this is DNA replication. One molecule of DNA producing two. Each of these could separate to produce two on their own, giving four. So the importance of hydrogen bonding and base pairing to DNA replication Right. It actually allows the process to occur. So when the two strands separate, right, nucleotides are added to form the new strand through base pairing. So without the base pairing, we would not have DNA replication. All right, so just to end off the video, you can take off these jettings and why hydrogen bonding and base pairing is important to DNA replication. So remember in DNA replication, so this one here is representing the, the original strand. So this one up here is representing the original strand. And the replication will lead to the, the formation of two new strands. So the line in red is representing the new strand of DNA that, that was made during replication. So this new strand was able to be made because base pairing, so remember, Let's say this was the original strand. This nucleotide would have been able to be added to this strand because guanine pairs with cytosine. So nucleotides are added because of base pairing. So cytosine base is sticking off. We look for the nucleotide with the guanine base, all right? And the same thing, if I say adenine, we add thymine. So because of base pairing, we can add a nucleotide. And the base pairing would not 
be able to be achieved without the hydrogen bonds. So new strands are synthesized because of the hydrogen bonding and covalent, sorry, because of hydrogen bonding and base pairing. So that is why they are important. The next video coming up is that DNA is replicated semi-conservatively and we are going to we are going to look at the experiment that was able to show that it is replicated semi-conservatively. As you can see here, the two new strands of DNA, both of them have in a copy of the original strand. So the black lines are the original strands. So each one has the original and a new one. So we say it is semi-conservative. So in the next video, we will do a semi-conservative replication. And then the following videos, we will go detail now into DNA replication, then transcription and translation. So we have a few more videos to go. All right, but this is where we will stop. If you have any question, you can leave it in the comment section.